So I'm not in a big rush tonight because I think tonight's going to be a shorter class. But anytime I say that, um, often it turns into my longest class. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that on this final night of our class, we can stop and consider that you are God Almighty. And we thank you that there is nothing you cannot do that does not contradict your character. And as we look to you, May you continue to encourage us wherever we find ourselves in our life, remembering that we worship a God who is able to do above what we can ask and what we can think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So this is our final and last class looking at the attributes of God. Asking the question, what is God like? Because as we learned, all that God has is all that God is. So when we say that God is love, that is his attribute. That is who he is. It is an aspect of his nature. So we do not say God has love or God has holiness but that God is holy, that God is love. So that's why we say all that God has is all that God is. And when we look at the attributes of God, we really are asking that question and answering the question, what is God like? An attribute is a characteristic um, about God that describes who he is, his person, his nature. And as we were talking um, Throughout the week, it's incredibly encouraging for us uh, to consider the God that we worship because he is worthy of our worship um, by, by definition of who he is, right? Uh, we will worship God for who he is. So with our final class uh, being today, our next class begins on August 23rd. Um, if you came in just a little bit ago, I wanted to point your attention. There's a sign up. If you sign up here tonight, I will sign you up online so you don't have to worry about it. Just maybe take a picture of the date or mark it on your calendar. The next class is called How Dare You? Uh, Pastor John is going to be teaching and addressing a lot of questions uh, targeted towards you as a Christian, asked by a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or some of the cults that you might run into. He's also going to address Catholicism. Um, he's going to look at the secular culture and the questions that our culture asks us. And he's also getting, going to look at the LGBTQ plus questions that we get as well. All right, so <clears throat> very helpful class. Encourage you to sign up tonight. All right, so with that, as we look at our last class, we go back to A.W. Tozer's quote in the knowledge of the holy. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us because it shapes and forms our view of the world we live in. It shapes and forms the view that we have of ourselves and of God. And we want to remember that these things have direct and practical implications on our life, right? That we recognize this when we pray, that when we pray to God, we want to know who the God is that we are praying to. And the more that we know God, the more that we love God. And the more that we love God, the more we desire to obey God. All right, so when we learn about who God is, his character and nature, it has direct and practical implications on our day-to-day -day living. Our final and last class, we are going to look at God and his attribute of 
omnipotence, right? God is omnipotent. Literally, omnipotent means that God has unlimited power, that he is all, omni, all powerful. So this is incredibly significant for us because when we go to God in prayer, we need to remember that we are the ones who put God in a box. We are the ones who often limit his ability, which is why we, we, the scriptures remind us that, that he can do above what we can ask and what we can think because he is God omnipotent. We're reminded from our main text in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, when Abram, later Abraham, was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. So here we see that God discloses himself as God Almighty, which literally means mighty God, right? That his declaration about himself to Abraham, and if you remember the promise that he makes to Abraham here, he tells Abraham that he is going to give him a son that will lead to descendants that outnumber the stars in the sky. It's the promise that the Messiah would come through his family line. And this is incredible because this is a man who's 99 years old. Now, I don't know about you, but my, my great-grandpa, um, he actually made it uh, to 92, all right? So I, maybe, maybe your great-grandpa um, outlived my great-grandpa, but when I look at my great-grandpa, the last announcement I expect him to make is... <laughs> Good news, grandma's going to have a baby. <laughs> right? That, that's not what I'm expecting him to say. All right? Because my grandma was only a few years younger than him. Right? So this is an incredible promise that God makes. And he reminds Abram that he is God Almighty. He is the mighty God. And he is able to do what Abram cannot that he is able to, uh, to empower um, Abram to actually be able to um, conceive a son with his wife because he is almighty God. Revelation chapter 19 verse 6 says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. <laughs> so God's omnipotence is his ability to do as he pleases and accomplish what he purposes. So because God is all powerful, he has the ability to do whatever he pleases. And he can accomplish whatever he purposes. And then this last sentence is important for us to consider. His actions are only limited by his perfection. See, it's a frightening thought that there is a being who is able to do anything that they please. Anything. That nothing can prevent him from accomplishing his purposes. Right? Think about if we were going to take that kind of power and give that to a human being. All right? That's a frightening thought. 
But what's comforting for us is that the God who is God omnipotent is a God who is only limited by his character. So when God does whatever he pleases, we have to view it through the lens that God is holy, that God is merciful, that God is just, that God is good, that God is love. Right? So it is that God cannot do anything that would violate his character. He cannot do anything that would be untrue about himself. Now, we can apply this analogy to ourselves lightly. All right? Um, th there are things that you can do. You have the ability to do them, but because of who you are, you never will do them. Does that make sense? I heard it illustrated, and I know this was an illustration on the spot, um, so I'm going to just take it. Um, <laughs> he, he was talking about teaching a class, and he said, I have the ability right now to pick up this pulpit and throw it across the room and finish my lecture yelling at the top of my lungs. I have the ability to do that right now. But who I am as a person prevents me from doing that, right? So in a small way, we can understand and what, what we're talking about here, right? That, that, that there are a lot of things we may have the ability to do but we will not do them because we're bound by our person or our character. Uh, and in the same way, God is bound by his character, right? So as we're going to see, there are some things that God cannot do because he is limited by only himself. So the power of God is the ability and strength whereby he can bring to pass whatsoever he pleases, whatsoever his infinite wisdom may direct, and whatsoever the infinite purity of his will may resolve. God's power is like himself, infinite, eternal, incomprehensible. It can neither be checked, restrained, nor frustrated, right? So God is not merely uh, possessed with great power. He is all powerful and limitless in his power, infinitely powerful because we know he creates and sustains all things. And it follows that all power would belong to him because we know that God is not subject to change, we understand that his power can neither increase nor decrease. If it is true that knowledge is power, how powerful is the one who holds all knowledge? Because God is not bound by location or time, his power is able to be exercised anywhere and at any time. Though we do not always perceive it, God's power is always active, and absolutely unfailing. Unlike us, he does not need to take a break to regain his strength. He does not require sleep or rest of any kind. He does not faint or grow weary, as Isaiah 40, 28 says. He has never needed or to take a Sunday afternoon nap. <laughs> Right? He's never nodded off in the midst of reading a sentence of his favorite book. The six days of creation is a reminder that he did not, he wasn't drained of one iota of his power. And yet in his compassion, he set a pattern of rest on the seventh day for the benefit of his power limited creatures. Right? Think about that. That, that. that God does not increase or decrease in strength. I don't know about you guys, but I get tired, right? Um, I don't work out. It's pretty obvious, but I do know 
that I can only work out for a certain amount of time until I grow weary, right? That my strength leaves me. Um, my son is going to increase in strength. Right now, he does his best, and he thinks it's fun uh, to lift big and heavy things, right? The other day, we caught him lifting a big box of his little fruit pouches, right? And we knew he was picking them up because we could hear him grunting all the way from the kitchen, <laughs> right? He, uh, now, one day, he will be able to pick up that box with one hand. But today, it takes him two hands and a whole lot of grunting, right? He will increase in strength, right? In fact, I, I purposely like to, in those moments, uh, run not to help him but to show off, right? Um, just to grab it with one hand uh, just while I can, you know, and press him just a little bit. Uh, because in a few years, that's not going to be the case. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it's a reminder that we can do some things, but God can do all things. God has made us creatures um, with a, and when we think about power and exercising um, choices, right? Uh, God has made us creatures with a will and we exercise um, choice and make real decisions regarding events in our life. But as we certainly have found out, um, our plans and our choices can be, can be uh, stopped. They can be prevented. They certainly can be frustrated, right? But there is nothing that God chooses to do that um, it frustrates him or prevents him from doing it. God can do all things. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Right? So back to Genesis and him making that promise to Abram that his wife Sarah would have a son. And he reminds them that there's nothing that's too hard for the Lord. Now, you guys were so quick to say, no, nothing's too hard for him. But again, think about how many times we go to him in prayer and we don't pray with that kind of confidence that the Lord can do anything, that nothing is too hard for him. Now, notice he says at his appointed time, right? And that's what we have a hard time with. At his appointed time. Often we mistake uh, God not working in our timing with God being unable to do something. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. So God's power is only limited by himself, his character. So God cannot will or do anything that would deny his own character. And this is why the definition of omnipotence is um, stated in terms of God's ability to do all his holy will. <clears throat> it is not absolutely everything that God is able to do, but everything that is consistent with his character. For example... God cannot lie, right. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. God cannot lie, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. He is called literally the unlying God, or the God who never lies. The author of Hebrews says that God's oath and promise, um, it is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6, 18. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says of Christ, he cannot deny himself. Furthermore, James says that God cannot be tempted with evil, and he, and he himself tempts no one with evil. So God cannot lie. He cannot sin. He cannot deny himself or be tempted with evil. He cannot cease to exist or to be God or to act in any way that's inconsistent with any of his attributes. 
So two main uh, categories that we see God's omnipotence demonstrated throughout the Bible and in our everyday life. The first being God's omnipotence or his power over his creation. That God has all power over his creation. And the second category is that God has power over circumstances. That God has power over all circumstances. <clears throat> so God's power over creation. God exercises uh, power over his creation. Um, this sometimes, when we talk about God's right to exercise his power over his creation, we would be referring to God's sovereignty. Right, that God as creator has the right to exercise power over his creation. He is sovereign king over his creation. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So when we look at the creation around us, it speaks to the attribute of God's power. That, that God is all powerful and he spoke the world into existence. <clears throat> so every time we see a beautiful sunset, Every time we go to somewhere like the Grand Canyon, every, every time we go somewhere where we just see a, a, something that's beautiful and stunning, this points to the power of God. It points to the God who is all-powerful. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. God created all things and he sustains all things and all things were created for him. So because we know that he creates and sustains all, it follows that all power would belong to him. God also has power over circumstances. Power over all circumstances. Now, I, I want to use this outline. Now, keep in mind those broad categories. We're kind of going to over. We're going to we're going to overlap in some of these areas, but I think that this is an incredible outline that shows Jesus is God and Jesus is omnipotent, which is significant because we're going to look at the gospel of Mark. And, and if you've ever, if you've ever gotten into videos where uh, people want to discredit the deity of Jesus, often what they'll say is, well, you know, later on in John, you have Jesus walking around claiming to be God. But that developed over time, right? If we look at the oldest gospel that we have, the first gospel that was written, Jesus doesn't say he is God, all right? But in John, that's our latest gospel we have. He's walking around and saying that he is God, right? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Mark, the gospel that is our first gospel written, and we're going to see that Jesus makes it very clear that he is God. First, by reminding us that he is all powerful over sickness. Right? If you're writing notes, Jesus is all powerful over sickness. Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, we see that there is a paralyzed man. And he has a group of friends who carry him on his bed to Jesus. And when they get to the house, the house is full. And Jesus is in the house preaching. So what do they do? They climb up on the roof. And they start tearing open the roof. And they lower their friend down. And when they lower their friend down, Jesus heals this man. 
But what's significant is he exercises his power over sickness for the purpose of showing that he is God. And because he is God, not only does he have power over sickness, but he has the authority to forgive sin. Because the point of that passage is that Jesus is God. Because what happens when, when that man is lowered down, Jesus says something surprising. He says, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. Now, I'm sure the friends were surprised. I'm sure the man was surprised. But who was really angry? were those who were around watching, the religious leaders who were thinking in their heart, this is blasphemy. Who is this man who forgives sin? No one forgives sin but who? But God. Jesus then says, what is easier to do? Right? Right? To tell this man to get up and walk or to forgive sin. So he tells the man to get up to walk. He gets up and walks so that he can verify through that miracle that he has power over sickness. Yes, but he has the authority as God to forgive sin. Right? So Jesus is all powerful and he has power over sickness He has power over sin. And we also read in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, that Jesus has power over the sea. Right? What happens? Jesus tells his disciples to get into the boat, and he says, we will cross to the other side. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. He makes a promise to them that, hey, We're going to go to the other side. And then Jesus goes to sleep. And a great storm arises. And the disciples panic. And they come to Jesus and say, Do you not know we're going to die? We're going to die! And Jesus gets up. And he speaks a word. And the sea is calm. Be still. Be still. He exercises his power over creation, over the sea. And the whole point of that passage is that Jesus is God, because only God has power over creation. So he has power over sickness. He has power over sin. He has power over the sea. And in Mark chapter 5, we also see that Jesus has power over Satan. Jesus has power over Satan. So, one takeaway is God has the power to lead us through what he leads us to. So from John chapter 4, when it comes to the sea, a takeaway for us that brings comfort is whatever God leads us us to, he's going to lead us through. He is going to lead us through it. Romans chapter 8. Verse 28 reminds the believer that we know all things God works for good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So, Mark chapter 5, we read that Jesus is all powerful and he exercises power over Satan. Mark chapter 5, verse 1, they come face to face with a demon-possessed man who identifies himself as legion, for he says there are many. And what Jesus does is he casts these demons into a group of pigs, and the pigs throw themselves off a cliff. But here's what I want us to take note of. This is so incredible. The demon's interaction with Jesus. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to a country of the Genres. And when he had come out 
of the boat. Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken into pieces. Neither could anyone tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. Right? This means that he bowed down. So he ran up to Jesus and he fell down to his knees. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he also begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. And now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. And all the demons begged him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. (laughs) Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. And there were about 2000 And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So Jesus is God and God is all powerful. And it's important for us to remember that Satan is a created being. Often we have this false view of Satan where we think that God and Satan are in this cosmic battle. This cosmic battle between good and evil. And when we look at the evil in this world, we could find ourselves doubting and thinking that Satan might win the day. And while it's certainly true that Satan is called the prince of this world, right? That he has a rule or dominion in this world. Ephesians chapter 2, the prince of the power of the air. But here's what I need you to know and I want you to see in this text. Satan's power as a created being is limited by the sovereign Lord and it is temporary. It is temporary and it is limited. That brings comfort as we consider that Jesus is Lord Almighty. The next thing that we see is that God is all powerful and He is mighty to save. All right? Mark chapter 10, verse 17, we see the story of the young rich ruler. Now, you guys might know uh, this instance. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, you have the young rich ruler who comes to Jesus. And asks him how to inherit eternal life. But what I want to draw our attention to. And what I tend uh, to, to see that we skip over. Is when Jesus actually explains to the disciples what just happened. All right. So let's go ahead and read. Starting in verse 17. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. You know, the commandments do not commit adultery. 
Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Or do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way. Sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. But he said, but he was sad at his word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now, usually when we hear this passage taught, that's where, that's where we stop reading. Okay. Okay. But I want us to look at verse 23. This is directly after the, the, the interaction with the young rich ruler. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked to them and said, With men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. The disciples were astonished because in their mind, this is a man who was blessed by God. He was a religious leader, and he was rich. And they immediately thought if this man was was materially blessed by God with riches, certainly he had God's favor. And if he had God's favor, then certainly he was going to heaven. And Jesus says, no. With man, rich or poor, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This is encouraging because we all have somebody in our mind that we think is never going to come to faith in Christ. We look at their riches or we look at their pride or we look at their lifestyle and we say, man, it is absolutely impossible. And the scriptures agree with that. But what we forget is with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. We have to remember that God is mighty to save. We have to remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to remember that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. See, God has the power to lead us through what he leads us to. And we remember as we ask this question and consider God is all powerful. I think that it's easy for us or for anybody who hears this message and is skeptical to think to themselves, okay, well, if God can do anything and that God is all powerful, then why does a good God who can stop evil allow it to continue? Right? And and here is how you answer that question by reminding them that it's the wrong question to ask. The right question is how much longer will God allow evil to go unpunished? How much longer will God allow evil to go unpunished? Because it's very clear in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, talking about His coming. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. So when you're confronted 
with the question of if God, why evil? You must remember and you must remind that friend that they're asking the wrong question. You must remind them that God is patient. That God is coming back. And when he comes back, he will judge evil. For a righteous and holy God will not allow the guilty to go unpunished. And if God were to stop evil in its tracks right now, that would mean the evil man or woman who is asking the question about God's goodness will be judged. And yet God is patient towards them, desiring all men to come to faith in Christ. It's been said that God will never permit any evil if he could not bring good out of evil. When we consider Romans 8, we remember that God is over all things and that God is working all things for his glory. And we're encouraged that it may be impossible to save ourselves but all things are possible with God, our Savior. Right? We can't save ourselves. No matter how hard we work, no matter how strong we think we are, no matter how many good deeds we perform, we are unable to do. Yeah. But God, omnipotent, is able, and he is mighty to save. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are God who is in heaven and is on earth. And we ask as we've delved into this study and just scratched the surface, you would encourage our heart, that you would increase our faith as we have studied the object of our faith. And that we would leave this place praising you for who you are. Would you encourage us and bring these truths to mind? By your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right.